a neuroscientist by trade, and last year I was on the neurotech panel. But as Lou said, uh, in so many of our in our, so many of our sessions last year, we really were finding that the things that determined whether a technology was going to be utopian or dystopian uh, were social. So whether uh, a product was going to be held privately by a few people for the purposes of uh, profit. Uh, often seem to lead down dystopian routes, whereas uh, when uh, there's sort of ownership by the stakeholders, the technologies seem to be uh, sort of more uh, utopian in their trajectories. And so I am excited to be here this year to be talking about uh, social structures and social experiments. Um, I'm going to, let me, does this work? Yeah. So I'm going to start with this quote. I'm not going to talk about capitalism too much, don't worry. Uh, but I'm going to start with this quote. It's easier to imagine the end of the world uh, than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. So this is a Frederick Jameson quote. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is uh, because I think we really lack an imagination when it comes to our social structures. We just cannot think outside of the box uh, in, in comparison to the ways that we think about innovating with other technologies where we're like, we're going to go to Mars and we're going to freeze our bodies and we're going to do all those extraordinary things. And when it comes to our social structures and our uh, economic systems, we really just, you know, we really sort of feel stumped. And I think... that um, the problem with this is that we cannot really create uh, what we can't imagine. And I think uh, my sort of ask to you here today is that we really just try and shift our, our discourse and try and think about not just how humans are and what you think we are capable of, but what we could be capable of if we really opened our sort of imagination chakras. Um, so the call for experimentation with social structures, uh, I'm uh, going to try and sort of persuade you that this isn't under the radar technology that will determine the, many of the uh, future trajectories, uh, collective futures. So cultural evolution is very rapid, um, and yet we really don't experiment with it. Uh, if you think about how much uh, money and time we put towards genetic evolution, it's sort of remarkable that we don't really uh, do empirical research into cultural evolution. And our social institutions are changing. Families are changing, relationships are changing, marriages are changing, democracy is changing. On all, on all levels, um, these things are changing. And we have to ask ourselves now whether we're just going to be passive uh, in that or whether we're going to be architects of our future. And so, as I said, I'd like us to shift our discourse from what we think humans do. And, and a lot of social sciences is what sort of observes uh, what uh, uh, Homo sapiens does rather than think about what could humans do if we, if we change their circumstances? Um, and I just want to put a point in about utopian thinking, because this is often something we fall prey to. Uh, so utopian thinking can be a little bit dangerous because it sort of suggests that we have a one-size-fits-all uh, solution, and this you know, historically has been kind of dangerous, and we have to remember that uh, Homo sapiens is an extremely adaptive species. It's infiltrated the entire planet, um, and uh, it probably needs various different social systems uh, to thrive. I also just want to take a second to remember that we're really privileged to be here thinking about our futures. Um, we live in a world where I think more than half the world don't have access to internet and so when we think about uh, what we want the world to look like I think we have to hold, hold everybody in mind and I think for me a way that's always been really powerful is the uh, Rawlsian uh, veil of ignorance which is you know, as a thought experiment, thinking that whatever society you decide to choose, you should be willing to take a randomly assigned position in that society. Uh, so I use that as a good metric of whether we've designed a good uh, society. So my call to arms is that we should be experimenting with all of these levels of society, from the individual and the personal experiment, to the dyad, uh, to small groups, um, communities, villages, cities, nation states, and ultimately planetary uh, uh, structures. And so we have the quantified self when it comes to individuals. This is something we're all familiar with. Uh, there's a number of devices that you can sort of put on to like work out, I don't know, how many steps you've taken, what your dreams are like. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that what we really need is uh, quantified selves, which is an understanding of how humans operate together. So I'm just going to take you through a couple of experiments. It's really hard to go into them deeply, but I'm just going to try and like touch on a couple of things that we've done under the platform of the Social Observatory, which is a collective uh, of people working on science in the wild. Um, 
And I'm not going to go into too much detail. The point of this is really to stir the conversation for tomorrow uh, and get you thinking about the kinds of experiments you'd like to do. So thinking about the individual and the personal experiment is something I'm really fond of. I think we've lost touch with uh, the idea of the personal experiment. You know, uh, scientists historically have often done experiments on themselves, and that was deemed a very valid way of uh, investigating uh, how things work. And today, I think we're very much focused on scalability and generalized uh, findings. And I think we sort of lost touch with the idea of doing sort of personal experiments. So I do tons of these. Uh, this is one I did uh, last year. It's called Enclosed Cognition. Uh, and it's sort of based on the idea that um, enclosed co cognition is like um, the fact that what you're wearing often dictates your internal states, your decisions, and your behaviors. And so there's like pretty interesting data on like, uh, you know, if you're wearing a lab coat, people will pay more attention to you, but only if they know it's a lab coat. If they believe it's a painter's coat, they will not pay more attention to you. So these are very real things that affect what your subjective experience of the world is. And so I decided to wear a uniform for six months. Uh, it just said, this is a uniform on the back. And, uh, and it was just very interesting. You know, I, I, uh, I think it completely <laughs> changed my life, actually. Um, and I really recommend people sort of start thinking about these things. Uh, people did treat me very differently. I thought about myself very differently. It changed my interaction to shops a lot. Um, so this is something, you know, this is just an example of things that you can do on yourself. So going from the individual up to the next level, so thinking about collective experiments. So I'm lucky enough to live in a, a bunch of intentional communities that are really passionate about uh, doing sort of immersive experiments on themselves. Um, and the experiment we did a year ago was thinking about possessional speech. Now, this is based on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis that uh, the language you use dictates the kinds of thoughts that you have. Um, and there's like very interesting data showing that in languages where uh, you have different, uh, more words for different kinds of blue, it actually changes your ability to perceive those different colors. So language can, accept, can change cognition and perception. So we decided to design a little Slack bot that would um, sort of give you a little nudge every time you used possessional speech. Uh, the idea was to see whether this affected how our, our relationship to objects. Um, uh, it, it didn't go so well. <laughs> uh, so we uh, essentially we we launched this uh, on our community Slack, which has got about 400 members. Uh, and each time you said mine, his, hers, something like that, it would say, you know, is this really yours, or are you just using it right now? Um, and for some of us, this was like very thrilling, and for some people, it was extraordinarily upsetting. And uh, we had to abandon the experiment uh, three or four days in. Nonetheless, I still get messages from people today. Uh, telling me that they are still using this uh, method uh, to, uh, and have, it has changed their language even after all this time. Um, so another experiment that we've done, uh, this is a, an immersive residential experiment that lasted eight months um, that we did at the embassy network. Um, so uh, we decided, uh, all 15 of us, to live under different governance structures. Um, we collected data on happiness, productivity, and community interaction. Uh, and it was a really fascinating exploration into how, how we operated. I think the main things that we learned were uh, there's a generalized benefit to changing your system. We saw like a burst of, uh, of activity in everybody uh, every time we changed our systems. Uh, the other learning we had was uh, that shifting the, shifting the hierarchies was very helpful. Um, one minute. Oh, God. OK, so uh, I just want to touch on another one. This one's for you, David. So uh, this is a prototype of uh, an alternative justice system that we've been building for the last three years, uh, which is really based on transformative justice and gets completely away from the idea of guilt and innocence. Um, so but maybe we can talk about that later. And now the Social Observatory uh, is excited to sort of have this like physical platform on which to do experiments, which is the Red Victorian and Upper Haight Street. Uh, we're a 22-bedroom hotel, we're a science hotel now, um, where we run experiments in the wild. Our main focus has been pro-social behaviors, such as cooperation and communication. We're very focused on social isolation, which is a health pandemic in the US right now, and identity politics. Um, and it, we're really focusing on what can you make humans do rather than just how they behave. And the experiments that we've done have included stuff looking, these are, uh, we run experimental dinners where we study generosity with real money. 
uh, people sort of have the restaurant experience but they were actually participating in an experiment. Um, and here we are just about to launch our new experiment which is multi-brain EEG, uh, looking at sort of uh, group dynamics. Um, and so this is a platform on which people can come and like start experimenting with the kinds of ways that they might like to see humans uh, behave. So to summarize, our social formations, our institutions, our economies and political systems will change. Which speculative, speculative future trajectories uh, we go down um, and how technologies impact our world will be determined to some degree by social technologies. I'd like to ask what it means that we live in a world that where there is no way to explore alternative uh, economies. We have no way to change our economy, uh, unlike our political systems, and we have no real way of experimenting with our social systems on a planetary scale. And I'd like to ask whether we are individually or collectively ready uh, for the futures we hope for. Yay, thank you, Zarina. Um, one question for Zarina. David? Yeah, two things. First, what you described was not Rawls' veil of ignorance, but Harsanyi's. Sorry. <laughs> what you described was not Rawls' veil of ignorance, but Harsanyi's veil of ignorance. In Rawls' version, you evaluate society assuming you're going to be the worst off person, which has never made any sense to me. But second, I can't understand why you say that, no, that, that people don't imagine other alternative structures of society because they've been doing so for a long time. The medieval monasteries were a very different structure from the world around them. Uh, Lenin, Mao, and Pol Pot all imagined very different societies and they worked catastrophically badly. The inventors of the Israeli kibbutzim and the Oneida com commune invented different societies, and they worked pretty well for one generation, but only for one generation. So what you're doing sounds very interesting, but I think you, maybe it's just the sort of the routine fault of the young, but this is something that people have been doing for at least a thousand years and probably several thousand years. Uh, no, I totally agree with you. I'm not saying that we haven't done these things. I'm saying exactly that that historically humans have lived under many social structures, but the common like lay person that you speak to when you say, hey, like, let's think about why we don't do this, they, the, often the response you get is, oh, this is just always the way things have been, this is human nature, um, and, oh, uh, and so on and so forth. So I totally agree with you, and that what I'm saying is that the, the sort of like, uh, th those two facts seem like a paradox to me. We have done tons of things. Humans have very flexible uh, social structures. It's just that I think our common understanding of that is very narrow. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> one <laughs> yeah, one okay, audience went, question. Someone here? Okay. Yes? Are you coming for... No. Yes? Okay. I, I continue on from Professor Friedman's question. Have you looked at the research done in this area in the fields of communication and behavioral science? And if so, what are your thoughts on those? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're definitely not inventing a new field. Uh, you know, uh, there's tons of work in behavioral economics, in um, behavioral science. Uh, there's a new field called social, social physics. There's tons of stuff. Uh, and uh, we're definitely not claiming to be doing something uh, completely new, except that we're trying to take things out of the laboratory and into the wild, into, the, in, uh, into where humans actually behave. And part of the reason I've sort of stepped away from neuroscience is that I just can't get my head around studying brains, individual brains in, in dark, dark boxes, you know. Uh, and so I'm really interested in studying humans in their natural environment. And so, uh, yeah, those, all, the, all of that work is like uh, very relevant. And I think we're most interested in trying to replicate some of that stuff in, in, the, in the wild. Um, okay, my prediction, which has got nothing to do with my talk, was uh, in November 2020, um, uh, so I think um, my initial prediction was going to be brain-to-brain -brain, uh, decision-making uh, would be, direct brain-to-brain decision-making would be possible. Uh, turns out that's just, just been done. Uh, so uh, my prediction is uh, direct brain-to-brain, -brain, that is EEG to EEG or ECOG to ECOG, 
communication will allow the transmission of false information that is uh, lying. 